Phalgunasyamale Pakshe Dwarashaham Payovratam Archayet Aravindaksham Bhaktya Paramayan Vita In the bright fortnight of the month of Palgun, February and March, for 12 days ending with Dwadasi, one should observe the vow of subsisting only on milk and should worship the lotus-eyed Supreme Personality of Godhead with all <coughs> devotion. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 8, Chapter 16, entitled The Payovrata Process of Worship, Text 25. Aditi, the loving mother, of the devas is in unbearable distress. Her children, who she loves, however old they may be, a true mother's heart never changes whatever their position they may take. She sees them suffering miserably. They have been defeated, humiliated, plundered. They lost their positions, all their wealth, even their service. They're hiding in disguise. For one who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. You cannot imagine the suffering of the devas when they are dishonored in such a way. Where they have no other alternative than to run and hide in disguise. So their prestige has been crushed their physical facilities have been taken away totally. It's like we read in Mahabharata and Srimad Bhagavat, how when the Pandavas were exiled to the forest, who suffered the most? It was Kunti, even though she was not in exile. She was living in the palace, being protected by Bhishma and Vidura. But just thinking of her children, bereft of everything, such a calamity upon her heart. So in this state, Aditi is being taught by Kashyapa Muni, her husband, how the only solution to any real problem is to turn to Krishna. Otherwise, as Prahlad Maharaj explains, the solutions to our problems may solve the immediate need, but if they are bereft of God consciousness, generally, the solution creates a more complex and difficult problem than the original problem that it solved. Kashyapa Muni is instructing his wife, we have to turn to Krishna. And we find in the later verses 
how the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vamanadev, is going to come in this desperate situation to protect his devotees. And it is interesting, if we study the background of most of the great avatars, they appear when their devotees are in helpless, desperate conditions. There's not many avatars that come when the devotees are ha having nice, happy time. Because usually when that happens, they don't cry out for the Lord to save them. So we can go through the ten principal incarnations. There was Matsyavatar. It wasn't easy. There was a flood that flooded the entire world. And everything was going to be destroyed. But the Lord appeared to Satyavrat to save him. And not only save him, but save all the world forever by restoring the Vedas, which is the purpose of life, which is the means of salvation to everyone, the word of God. Then there was Kurma. The Devas were trying to, they were in a helpless condition. They lost everything. The only means by which they can gain it back by churning the ocean of milk. And then the mountain, which was meant to be the churning rod, was sinking and sinking and sinking, and they couldn't do anything to keep it up. And they were screaming and crying, Krishna, Vishnu, save us. And Vishnu appeared as Kurma to save the day and support it on his back. And when the earth planet was plunged in the Garabodak Ocean, quite a helpless situation. <clears throat> if you think a tsunami is bad, <laughs> a tsunami is just when a wave of the ocean comes upon the earth. But this is a situation where the entire earth goes to the bottom of the ocean. That's a pretty dramatic situation. <clears throat> And the sages and the rishis and the devas, they prayed, what to, they, they were helpless, whoever they were. Even Brahma, all he could do was pray to Vishnu, who appeared from his nose as Varaha Avatar and lifted the earth. And Prahlad was in such a helpless condition, being persecuted by his father, and not only that, but Hiranyakashipu was terrorizing the whole world. And the sages and the rishis and the devotees, they were all praying, and he appeared as Narasimha Dev. Parasaram, when the Kshatriyas were exploiting the innocent, the Lord appeared. And Ravana, We should offer our salutations to Ravana because by his misdeeds, Lord Ramchandra appeared and performed his beautiful pastimes to deliver all humanity forever. And Krishna, Kamsa, Jarasandha, and all of these asuras, they were conquering all directions. The devas were helpless, the devotees were helpless, and like little Prahlad, who was being harassed so horribly by Hiranyakashipu, Vasudeva, and Devaki, they had to tolerate seeing six of their children brutally murdered right in front of their eyes as they spent years and years in chains in a prison cell. But it was that environment in which Swayam Bhagavan, Sri Krishna, appeared within this world.
and of course, seeing that the Vedas were being exploited by so-called Brahmins for their own egoistic reasons, and innocent animals were being slaughtered due to, mis due to a deviant interpretation of Vedic sacrifices. Vishnu appeared as Buddha. It was an emergency. And we don't have to go into so many details about Kalki. <laughs> Very difficult situation. And when Adoita Charya and all the other Vaishnavas saw the effects of Kali Yuga mounting greater and greater, they cried out, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. So this is a very, very consistent message. Of course, everyone likes a nice, peaceful, and congenial environment to chant Hare Krishna and to be with blissful devotees and to be happy. Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. But chanting Hare Krishna means we find our happiness in Krishna, not in the external circumstances. And if external circumstances are very nice, that's very nice if we're taking shelter of Krishna with a grateful heart. But the tendency in this world is something has to shake us up for us to really, really take shelter. And essentially, bhakti is about taking shelter. So Kashapa Muni here in this verse is instructing Aditi how to bring the Supreme Personality of Godhead into this world. Krishna is our only shelter. And he's giving her some tapasya to perform. Two weeks, a fortnight of only <coughs> drinking milk. That tapasya is required to show our sincerity, to take our minds away from all the distractions of material enjoyment, and also to help us to really fix our mind on our purpose. But these, this verse concludes with Kishapa Muni. He's saying one should worship the lotus-eyed Supreme Personality of Godhead with all devotion. <clears throat> one can only approach Krishna through devotion. Whatever deity worship, whatever mantras we chant, whatever food we eat, whatever austerities we perform, whatever charity we give, it is utterly meaningless to Krishna if it is not offered with devotion. There's a beautiful story in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela that exhibits this principle. Every day, Lord Chaitanya would perform Nam Sankirtan in the house of Srivas. And sometimes, and for a year, he did it all night, every night, with his devotees. <clears throat> but he was very strict. Later on, he was very lenient as far as giving the holy names and inducing everyone to chant, whatever their position. But in the house of Srivas, it was a very intimate experience. Because there, the Lord was revealing His divine ecstasies completely freely. But He could only do that among those devotees who had no trace of any material desires. Those people who loved Him and served Him 
with pure devotion, his intimate associates, and he would not allow anyone else inside. The doors were locked, the windows were shut, and they performed Nam Kirtan. <clears throat> There was a Brahmin who was a very austere brahmachari. <coughs> Every day he would come to Srivas Thakur. Repeatedly he would request him, O oh, Thakur, I beg you, I have one desire in my life that only you could fulfill. Allow me to see the great Nimai Pandit dance. Even just one time, allow me to see it. He was yearning, he was longing. But Srivas Thakur would tell him, it is not possible, because you are not one of the people that is selected by the Lord as one of his most intimate associates. You can chant, you can dance anywhere, but coming in this house, because of people who were not qualified were to see in the Lord and his devotees manifesting these ecstatic symptoms, they would not understand it. Sometimes a class of people called sahajyas, they imitate these ecstatic symptoms through practice in order to gain fame, recognition, and followers to show the world how much they love God. But a devotee doesn't want to show the world how much they love God. They want to love God and help the whole world to love God. So Lord Chaitanya did not want cheap followers. And also, they just would not understand Generally, a great personality will not reveal these ecstatic symptoms unless there's an audience who could really understand. Similarly, generally, great personalities do not discuss very, very high intimate spiritual topics exhaustively unless there's an audience that is spiritually elevated enough to actually be able to not only understand it, but experience it. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was, that was his rule, and Srivas explained it. But still, that Brahman was so determined. He was very honest, he was very moral, extremely peaceful person and very austere. He was a brahmachari, lifelong brahmachari, with no intention for anything else. So finally, Srivas, seeing his really good qualities, he said, all right, because you are so pure in heart, and because you've been you're, you're a strict celibate, and you only drink milk and eat fruits, and we really want to see it, I will bring you inside. But I'll have to put you in a secret place where you will hide so that no one except me knows that you're there. So the brahmachari came a little early, and Srivas gave him a nice hiding place where no one would see him, but he could see. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came with his devotees. Mahaprabhu said, Haribo. And the devotees began to chant, Nam Sankirtan. Very sweet. Mardangas were playing, cartels were chiming, and how the devotees were singing with such intense emotion and devotion. Then Lord Chaitanya danced. The most ch 
charming, intoxicating, enchanting experience that anyone could possibly be gifted with is the vision of Sri Chaitanya dancing. As he was dancing, Nityananda Prabhu and Gadadhar Pandit were dancing around him in ecstasy. And Advaita Charya, he was hither and thither, going here and there, dancing, 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 as if he was floating in ecstatic joy. And all the devotees in Sri Vasangam were drowning in an ocean of transcendental bliss as the holy names was all that could be heard. Understand the nature of these kirtans. It wasn't about showing how you can dance or how you could play murdanga or how nicely you could sing. It was about being absorbed in Krishna who is not different than his name. That's all. There was no false ego. Everyone did their best simply for Krishna, to give pleasure to Krishna, to give pleasure to each other. Sankirtan, full, complete, together. The Murdangas, in these Prem Sankirtan of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the only focus was simply on chanting the holy names. That's all. Total absorption in every syllable of the name. And in their ecstatic love, in every syllable of the name, these devotees were tasting Krishna and Sri Radharani. They were experiencing Brindavan the leelas of the Lord, the form of the Lord, the qualities of the Lord were all being manifest through the name. And the playing of the murdangas and the playing of the karatals and if they had horns that they were blowing and whatever instruments, it was the holy name playing them. The power, of the, the energy of the holy name. They were just absorbed in the name and the murdanga was just... They, it was just splendid. The Prem Kirtan, the Murdangas were just, they were just like puppets of the holy name playing. And they weren't, pre they weren't dancing according to some um, classical lessons that they had previously. <laughs> they were simply immersed in the name and in their ecstasies of being immersed in the name, their body just danced. They just let it, let it go. So in this way, this is Nam Kirtan and its perfection. And this is what we should strive for. Kirtan's about totally engrossing oneself, absorbing oneself exclusively in the sound of the holy name. Japa, Kirtan, Bhajan, that's it. Everything else is just a way of doing that. Rinarapi suni chena, taror ibase hishnuna, amani na manade na kirtaniya sadahari. Before these all night kirtans began, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, this was his only instruction how to do it. Very instructive to everyone. He said, why are we wasting, we're, we're doing kirtan in the day, why are we wasting our night sleeping? Time is so valuable. We should do kirtan all night, every night, for the, uh, for the next one year. That means no sleep. And devotees, they didn't start, you know, arguing with him, well, what about <laughs> They knew the power of the holy name. They knew the power of his mercy. But then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed them how to do it. Trinarapi suni chena taror ibasi hishnuna amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari. That one should be more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, 
ready to offer all respect to others and expect none in return. In this way, one can constantly chant the Holy Name. <laughs> Throughout the house of Srivas Thakur, all that could be heard was the sweet sound of the holy name. And the very person who was non different than his holy name, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was dancing in ecstasy as they were chanting the holy name. This was a very esoteric experience to contemplate that <clears throat> for Lord Chaitanya, he was in the role of a devotee, showing how to be a devotee by being absorbed in the holy name. But all those devotees there understood that he's Krishna himself. So although Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in the mood of Radha, is tasting Krishna's holy names in ecstasy and trying to show people how to do it in the role of a devotee, for the devotees, they were chanting the holy names and they were seeing the holy name himself personified, dancing in ecstasy to their chanting. Now, just to intensify your attention, the benediction of hearing this story <laughs> with faith, devotion, and rapt attention is we can be reunited with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and see his beautiful kirtan. <laughs> so the kirtan was going on and everyone was besides themselves immersed in the supreme happiness. Suddenly, Lord Chaitanya, and, and actually their greatest happiness was to see Lord Chaitanya happy. They were chanting and dancing so nicely for Lord Chaitanya's pleasure, and seeing him happy was their ultimate happiness. And knowing that Lord Chaitanya is non different than his name, Radharani and Krishna are non different from their names, when we perform kirtan, we should be thinking the same way. Is our consciousness, individually and collectively, is it in such a state that we are pleasing the Lord? Pleasing the Lord is our happiness. Suddenly, Lord Chaitanya stopped the kirtan very abruptly. And he became very sober. He said, today I am not feeling my usual ecstatic love. Something is wrong. Is there someone in this house who is not supposed to be here? Srivas was very much afraid. Now, how could he be afraid? <clears throat> Why would he be afraid? Bajahure mana sri nandanandana abhoya charanara Govinda Das, the poet, has prayed, just worship the lotus feet of Sri Nanda Nandana and you will become fearless. This entire material existence is especially characterized by fear. Fear of loss, fear of death. As soon as the eternal soul, the Atma, identifies with this temporary body, inevitably there will be fear. But one who takes shelter of Krishna is fearless. We were discussing last night <clears throat> the, the gopas of Sri Brajbhumi. 
they saw Agasura, who was the personification of envy and cruelty. And he was so angry. His sister, Putana, and his brother, Bakasura, were both killed by this little gopa named Krishna. And he wanted revenge, serious revenge. Not only did he make the determined vow to kill Krishna, but he wanted to kill all Krishna's friends knowing that if I kill all the cowherd boys, then the parents, they will all die. If I kill all the calves, then all the cows will die in separation from their children. Agasura wanted to eliminate the entire race of Brijabhasis. What is that called these days? Genocide. <laughs> Genocide. He didn't want, just like Hitler didn't want another Jew to ever live in this world. Killed them all. He killed over half of them in Europe. Three-fourths of them in Europe. So Agasura made Hitler look like a nursery school. <laughs> nursery school demon. <laughs> he was, Agasura was PhD demon. <laughs> he could expand himself to be, what, eight miles long and opened his mouth with this vengeful will to kill everyone. Now, can you imagine a demon like that standing before you? I've seen devotees. A little snake this big just slither, slithers in front of you on the road and <gasps> <laughs> What to speak of the little snake with a diamond-shaped head, which means he's poisonous, looks at you and opens his mouth. Tell me, what will you do? Hopefully you'll chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> because it might be your last chance. <clears throat> now you're adults, and these are just little children, gopas. And they saw Agasura, and some of them, one of them started running away. Others were saying, no, no, this is just beautiful scenery. This is some special ornament for us to play on in Brajabhumi. And another boy said, no, no, this is a demon. Look, he's alive. He's a living snake. He's, he, we could feel the, the heat and the horrible smell of his intestines through his breath. This is a, his mouth was reaching to the clouds. He had gigantic fangs, teeth that looked like big icicles in a cave. And the boy said, oh, he's a demon, he's come to kill us. Krishna will save us. And they all started laughing. And all of them together, without exception, they danced right into Agasura's mouth. And they were smiling and clapping and looking at Krishna as they were doing it. Krishna will save us, so what if he's a big demon? <laughs> they were not bewildered, but Krishna became bewildered. <laughs> My friends are running right into this demon's mouth who's here to kill them, kill all of us. And then Krishna began to think, you know, he had to kill him in a very special way because they're, all his friends and all the calves are inside the demon's mouth. So he has to kill Agasura without harming everyone inside of him. So Agasura
Nagasura was waiting for Gopal. And then Gopal entered and he closed his mouth. And when he closed his mouth, it was so dark and so poisonous, so horrible, that all the children were unconscious. Samacharya said they were dead. Now Krishna, he never revealed super excellent opulences when he killed any of the asuras because he didn't want to interfere with the Brijabhasi's love for him as an ordinary child. Whenever he killed a demon, it was in such a way that they would justify that it's due to our worshiping of Vishnu that Vishnu saved him. Yes, Putana grew very big. But Gopal didn't grow big, he just remained. Can you imagine when she ran out of the house and grew, what was she, 12 miles long? And Gopal stayed the same size. It was hanging on to her breast. Could you imagine how big her breast was if she was 12 miles long? And Gopal was like, he was probably like this big in relationship. He's just <laughs> <laughs> and he's, and with those little tiny lotus feet, he's kicking her and he's sucking. But it was intolerable. So Krishna didn't grow. With all the demons, he kept his same appearance. But now nobody was watching, because all the children were dead. <laughs> and because he was inside the mouth, Yashoda and Nanda, nobody could see him. So he revealed an, an opulence to no one. He grew bigger, 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 bigger. Until he blocked all the air of Akasura. Now, Agasura, he was actually, because the boys, the gopas, were so jubilant, running into his mouth, and they were playing and joking, he actually felt an attraction for them. In his heart, he actually felt affection for them. And because he died in that state, his, his atma, burst from the top of his head and remained in the sky. Then his mouth opened, and Krishna glanced at his friends and brought them back to consciousness, and then they all happily danced out of Agasura's mouth. But Krishna was last, and when Krishna came out, the soul of Aga entered into Krishna's body. And he actually attained the spiritual world as an eternal associate of the Lord in Vaikuntha. Why? Because that last moment he actually had affection and appreciation for Krishna's friends. But the idea of this story is how devotees are fearless because they've taken shelter of Krishna. Now here is Srivas Thakur one of the greatest sages that's ever lived, an intimate associate of Lord Chaitanya. He's totally taken shelter of Krishna. He's Kirtaniya Sada Hari. He's chanting the holy names constantly. So why is Srivas afraid? Lord Chaitanya stopped his kirtan and said, is there anyone that is not supposed to be here in this house? Srivas was afraid because a devotee's fear is that we displease Krishna. He wasn't afraid of anything for himself. He wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of losing everything because he understands he's the eternal soul. But in bhakti, there is a fear of displeasing Krishna. Yashoda Mai was always afraid, but her fear was for Krishna's pleasure. Will Krishna be, will he step on a thorn while he's herding the cows? Or will one of the cows move their heads and, 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 and hit him with his horn? Or maybe the sun will be too bright and it will, Krishna's, 
His body is so soft and so delicate. If I just touch it, it turns colors. What to speak of the hot sun all day long and all the rocks and stones and the pathways. This kind of fear is billions and trillions of times higher platform than being fearless. <laughs> 